Hey, everybody. Gester has a funny expression. Gester? Gester? He's got a little speck of dust on his nose. Well, welcome, everyone. Let's jump in to uh, our reading. We'll um, read numbers, start reading numbers four. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take a census of the Kohathite branch of the Levites by their clans and families. Count all the men from 30 to 50 years of age who come to serve in the work at the tent of meeting. This is the work of the Kohathites at the tent of meeting, the care of the most holy things. When the camp is to move, Aaron and his sons are to go in and take down the shielding curtain and put it over the Ark of the Covenant Law. Then they are to cover the curtain with a durable leather, spread a cloth of solid blue over that, and put the poles in place. Over the table of the presence, they are to spread a blue cloth and put on it the plates, dishes, and bowls, and the jars for drink offerings. The bread that is continually there is to remain on it. They are to spread a scarlet cloth over them, cover that with the durable leather, and put the poles in place. They are to take a blue cloth and cover the lampstand that is for a light, together with its lamp, its wick trimmers and trays, and all its jars for the olive oil used to supply it. Then they are to wrap it and all its accessories in a covering of the durable leather and put it on a carrying frame. Over the gold altar, they are to spread a blue cloth and cover that with the durable leather and put the poles in place. They are to take all the articles used for ministering in the sanctuary, wrap them in a blue cloth, cover that with the durable leather and put them on a carrying frame. They are to remove the ashes from the bronze altar and spread a purple cloth over it. Then they are to place on it all the utensils used for ministering at the altar, including the fire pans, meat forks, shovels, and sprinkling bowls. Over it, they are to spread a covering of the durable leather and put the poles in place. After Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles, and when the camp is ready to move, only then are the Kohathites to come and do the carrying but they must not touch the holy things or they will die. The Kohathites are to carry those things that are in the tent of meeting. Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, is to have charge of the oil for the light, the fragrant incense, the regular grain offering, and the anointing oil. He is to be in charge of the entire tabernacle and everything in it, including its holy furnishings and articles. The Lord said to Moses, See that the Kohathite tribal clans are not destroyed from among the Levites, so that they may live and not die when they come near the most holy things. Do this for them. Aaron and his sons are to go into the sanctuary and assign to each man his work and what he is to carry. But the Kohathites must not go in to look at the holy things, even for a moment, or they will die. <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, excuse me, that's me talking, not the Bible. I, <clears throat> my throat's a little, it's allergies. The Lord, <clears throat> pardon me. The Lord said to Moses, take a census also of the Gershonites by their families and clans. Count all the men from 30 to 50 years of age who come to serve in the work at the tent of meeting. This is the service of the Gershonite clans in their carrying and their other work. They are to carry the curtains of the tabernacle, that is, the tent of meeting, its covering and its outer covering of durable leather, the curtains for the entrance to the tent of meeting, the curtains of the courtyard surrounding the tabernacle and altar, the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard, 
the ropes and all the equipment used in the service of the tent. The Gershonites are to do all that needs to be done with these things. All their service, whether carrying or doing other work, is to be done under the direction of Aaron and his sons. You shall assign to them as their responsibility all they are to carry. This is the service of the Gershonite clans at the tent of meeting. Their du duties are to be under the direction of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. Okay, let's stop there at verse 28. I'm just going to make a note so I remember. Okay. Okay, let's now move on to Act, Act 17. And I am recording this on Monday morning, but we'll be posting this um, the following Sunday. Just so you know. <laughs> okay, Acts chapter 17. Let's see here. Okay. Acts 17. When Paul and his companions had passed through and Fipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Perea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens, and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? 
You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we'd like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. <laughs> Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So, you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him... We live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed, among them, was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named, named Damaris, and a number of others. Okay, that's the end of Acts chapter 17. Yeah, that I really thought that was, um, I was going to say interesting, but I'm trying not to use that word anymore because I use it so much. So now I'll say that was very compelling. Um, there was something that really st stuck out to me. Where is it? Um, oh yeah, wait, oh yeah, verse 20, well, well, verses 24 through 27, I guess. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. I think that's really interesting. Oops, I said it. Interesting. I think that's fascinating. Um, yeah, that he basically has marked out our appointed times and where we're placed in history and our boundaries. And also that he doesn't need anything. You know, he's the giver. He's the giver of life. And that he doesn't build he doesn't live in temples built by human hands, even though we're reading, you know, through throughout Leviticus and um just the Old Testament how 
it seems like God made an accommodation for us to, you know, maybe let us know that he's present, he's with us, you know, at, at that time, the Israelites, you know, to, um, it was a, a, a picture of what was to come or a shadow of the substance to come. Everything that we're reading in the Old Testament about how, you know, really just pointing to Jesus. And then, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain to the temple was torn in two, meaning later we find out, I believe, that, that that's like a picture of his body that was torn for us so that we may have entry into the Holy of Holies. And, and then we become the temple so that, this, that his spirit dwells in us. But I also like that at verse 25, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Um, yeah, and so Paul, it's funny, the Athenians, you know, they're very philosophical and um, I don't know. I just kind of cracked up about how they're, what was it? Their, their attitude <laughs> was it's kind of funny to me. But um, Paul talking about the resurrection, um, you know, that's a new, new thing for them. But it, it seems like at the beginning of the passage, Paul was, yeah, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. It's funny, you know, you know, that's so full of idols and yet these philosophers are kind of highfalutin and lofty in their ideas and they love to talk about ideas. And that's what the, I think what I laughed at was that's what they do all day is talk about new ideas. <laughs> but um, so even though they're kind of, you know, it sounds like they're kind of intellectual, that the whole place was just full of idols that are pretty dumb, the idols, you know, idol worship, but yet they're, they're thinkers, you know, and so here Paul is talking about something completely new, and especially with the resurrection of the dead, when it says, verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Well, okay, I better end here and let's say a prayer. Lord, um, I pray for peace in my heart because I don't know why I feel a little disrupted today, this morning. Um, I pray you give me peace and help me make wise decisions so that I don't stress myself out, which I want to do. <laughs> I haven't been following the news, so I don't exactly know what's going on. But I pray, Lord, for your peace, for your kingdom to come, for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know that you don't need anything from us, but you do bless us both taking part in your kingdom and advancing your kingdom. But we thank you that um, you choose to give us life and bless us. Pray for everybody listening that they um, you would meet them where they're at and express your love to them. And I pray the same for myself. I thank you for, I thank you for this um, little reading the Bible to cats community, um, and for every person, I ask that you just bless each one in a special way. And as we read through your Word, I just pray um, for continued wisdom and insight because I don't. There's so much I lack, honestly even though I 
have studied all these years. I just, sometimes things don't seem to stick, Lord. <laughs> so I just ask that you help me retain what I, what I'm studying or reading. Um, and let it just filter down into my heart. But I pray that even as I continue throughout the days, weeks, months, years, whatever, reading through the Bible, that each time I read through it, that you would help me to learn and understand and have wisdom about what I'm reading. And basically, you're who you are and your character. And help me to trust you. Pray for the, the peace of Jerusalem and for the peace of Israel. Pray for I'd, this. I'm posting this on. I'm recording this a week before I post it, so I don't know what will have happened in the world. But I do pray for um, the release of the hostages. I pray for um, the Palestinian Christians. Just put your angels around them, Lord. Provide miracles for them and get them out of harm's way. And let them feel the prayers of their brothers and sisters throughout the world, Lord. And we pray for the people of Israel, your people, that you would help them to feel the prayers of people throughout the world. And we pray for the, the, the suffering, any suffering, um, people in Gaza, Lord, that you would provide for them. We pray for everyone who needs you, all the brokenhearted of the world, Lord, wherever, wherever they are, whatever country they're in, whoever they are, that you would be near. We know that you promise that you're near to the brokenhearted. And we thank you and ask for your spirit and your love to light our way and light our path. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone. Talk to you later. Bye.